Hi guys, uh, my name is IBM and today I'm going to record uh, multiple choice past paper questions. I'm going to record October, November 2023 papers after being asked by one of my students to record them. So here I am. And without wasting time, I would like to take you to the papers. I'll be starting with the paper 1-1, component 1-1, that is October, November 2023. So without wasting time, I would like to take you to the question papers. So I'll solve 1-1. I'll solve one, two. I'll also solve one, three. Uh, that will take me around three hours. So without take, wasting time, let me solve uh, one, one. So this is the question paper. Uh, I'll not go through the instructions. Just know it is one, one. It is one hour and 15 minutes. I'll try my level best to take one hour. So October, November, this paper is 40 marks. Um, each score I think is one mark. So without reading through the uh, constants, you can go through the constants. Here are the constants. You can also go through the formula that are given. So question number one. What is a reasonable estimate of the cross-sectional area of the wire of a paper clip? Of course, uh, the examiner expects that you have interacted with the paper clips. I think uh, the diameter of one paper clip is approximately one millimeter. I think the diameter, when you look at a paper clip, the diameter of the wire is approximately one millimeter. That means the radius could be approximately 0 0.5 millimeters. So I'm finding the cross section area. So area is going to be equal to pi r squared, which is going to be pi times the radius, which is 0 0.5 times 10 to the power of minus 3, and this is going to be uh, squared. So I'll check this with my calculator. So uh, from my calculator, I have pi times uh, 0 0.5 exponent minus 3, and this is squared. So this is giving me 7.85. Times 10 to the power of minus 7 meters squared. So this means my answer is automatically going to be C. Which quantity is not uh, an SI based quantity? It is not unit but quantity. So which quantity is not SI based quantity? So mass is a an SI based quantity, absolute temperature and time. So the answer is A, which, which it's, it's charge which is not SI based quantity. A student determines the acceleration of free fall by using a small metal ball as shown. Okay, so if I assume that the ball is here, it is starting from here, it means the distance PQ is not the same as the distance through which it falls. This is actual, the actual distance through which it falls. If, we, if this is the ball starting from here, the actual distance through which it falls before it hitting the trap door is this distance here. So that means the distance PQ is greater than the actual distance through which it falls, which is h. Okay, so it means if even if I repeat the experiment, but attaching the ball, uh, the metal ball at the electromagnet and measuring peak, it means there will be a systematic error. Even if I try to be as accurate as possible, when switch S is opened, the ball is raised from an electromagnet and an electronic timer is started. The ball then falls vertical downwards. The timer stops when the ball hits the trap door. The student measures the distance PQ between the electromagnet and the trap door. This distance and the reading on the timer are then used to calculate the acceleration of free fall. So from S equals to UT plus a half AT squared. So it's like uh, initial velocity is zero. So H is going to be equal to a half GT squared. So using T, and we need h, but the distance which is used is instead pq, which is greater than h. So which statement about the errors in the experiment is correct? The random error can be reduced by adding the diameter. Of course, random error is only reduced by taking the average. The random error is reduced by taking the average. The systematic error can be reduced by adding diameter of the ball to the distance pq. Systematic error can be reduced by adding uh, if we add the diameter of the ball to distance pq we make it even bigger 
than the distance through which it falls. So this one is not going to be correct. The actual distance is, is h is the same as p a p distance p q minus the diameter of the ball. This is the correct distance. The systematic error can be reduced by subtracting the diameter of the ball. So the answer is going to be, do we have to subtract the diameter of the ball to get the actual distance? That is if we aim at reducing the systematic error. Okay. The diagram uh, shows two coplanar forces, P and Q, drawn to scale. Uh, P, we have P to the left, to the right-hand side, and Q. Force R is given by R is Q minus P, which uh, diagram represents R. Okay. So if R, if R is to be uh, Q minus P, so it means on Q, I have to add the negative of P. So P is to the right. And the negative of P is going to be to the left. So if I try to draw here, at Q, I'm trying to put minus P. So this is going to be minus P. The arrow points in this direction. This is negative P. So Q plus negative, I have Q plus negative P. This should give me R. So if I move P plus negative Q, then the resultant is going to be here. Uh, these two are forming a clockwise loop. The resultant is going to be anti-clockwise. So the resultant will be here, which is the R will be anti-clockwise. So this will be R. So this means my answer is going to be C. So the answer is going to, if I say P, Q plus negative P, giving me R. It means when I add, uh, on Q, if I add the negative of P, I have just reversed P to get its negative. So R should point in that direction. So the answer is automatically C. Alternatively, you could look at it as R plus P should give you Q. But if I get R plus P, I should get Q. So I can just check these, these ones. On, on if, if I say this is R and I add P, if I add P, I cannot really get Q because this will be very long. The resultant will be a very long one, you know, so this is out. If, I, if this is R and I add P onto it, P is in this direction here, then the, result, uh, this, the resultant will be in this direction, which is also not Q. If I add, if this is R and I add P to it, remember P is in this direction here, so if I if I if on R I add P, you notice that the result the Q will be here, which is uh, the perfect direction for our answer there. So the answer is going to be C. A parachutist falls from a stationary balloon at time t equals to zero. The velocity time graph for the parachutist from t equals to zero until the time when he is just above the ground is shown. So I want you to look at this part here. The gradient is decreasing. So here we say the acceleration is decreasing. The part here, the gradient is zero because it's a horizontal line. So here the acceleration is zero. This is what we call terminal velocity. And here the gradient is uh, initially constant because it's initially a straight line. But then around here, you see that the gradient starts decreasing, but remember here the gradient is negative. So here A is negative, but then this part here, you see that there is a rapid change here. There's a rapid change when you look at this part here, there's a rapid change. So the acceleration is negative, but it's going to be bigger than the acceleration here in the first part. Negative, but bigger because the gradient for the, this part is negative. The gradient of this part is positive but decreasing. So this is negative gradient. It later on uh, decreases here. So when we look at the graph, we, it means the acceleration should be both on both positive and negative part. But initially, the acceleration should be decreasing. Let's check. Initially, acceleration is decreasing. Initially, the acceleration is decreasing. Initially, the acceleration is decreasing. 
okay so here initial accession is decreasing and positive here initial acceleration is actually decreasing but is negative so this one is out and this one is also going to be out so we look at this here initial acceleration is positive but decreasing that this part is fine and this is part is fine then between p and and q the acceleration is zero and this is fine for both this is also fine but then uh, let's look at the negative part notice that the gradient of this part here is much bigger than the gradient of the other part so between p and approximately between q and r the gradient here is very large so it means the acceleration here although it is negative must be bigger than the acceleration for the, uh, from the for the first part even though it is positive so when you compare a and b you notice that the answer is going to be b because somewhere between p and q the acceleration jumps to a bigger value compared to the initial acceleration here yet here it is showing that as if the acceleration is jumps to the same value as before which is really not true because the gradient here the line here in this part here is steeper than the line in this part here so the answer is going to be p a projector is fired from point p with a velocity v at an angle theta to the horizontal it lands at the point q a horizontal distance r from p after time t the acceleration of free fall is g r resistance is negligible so equations of motion are applicable which equation is correct so i'll just use s equals to ut plus a half a t squared if i consider a horizontal motion that is horizontal motion s is the uh, range r initial velocity will resolve v to the horizontal which will be v cos of theta times the time which time is given as capital t then plus since acceleration in the horizontal is zero so this will be a half times zero times t squared so it means r should be v times t cos theta so without even checking the rest of the equations R, the first equation is correct. R is Vt sine theta, it can, cos theta, it can't be sine. And these are all automatically wrong because the acceleration in the horizontal is zero. A man stands in a lift that is accepting vertically downwards. If it is accepting vertically downwards, it means the resultant force F, which is given by mass times acceleration, the resultant force is downwards. That's why the acceleration is downwards. Which forces are acting on the man? One, the man is exerting a force downwards, which is equal to the man's weight. And the lift must be exerting a force upwards on the man. This is the force by the lift, or contact force by the lift. Contact force by the lift. So if the, if the resultant force is downwards, it means the weight is greater than the contact force upwards. So it means the weight must be greater than uh, the contact force upwards. The contact force up by the lift is greater than the contact force by the lift. Because the resultant force F is going to be the weight minus the force by the lift so let's see uh, it is equal to the weight if it is equal there is no acceleration it is greater than the weight if it is greater the acceleration cannot be downwards it is less than the force exerted by the flow on demand which statement describes the force exerted by demand on the flow of course the force exerted by demand on the flow should be equal to the force exerted by the flow on demand that is mean that is according to newton's third law so this is not correct it is less than the weight of demand so the answer is going to be d the contact force by the lift upwards is less than the weight of demand that's why the acceleration is downwards so the answer is going to be d the ball of mass 200 grams which is 0 0.2 kilograms is thrown horizontally with a speed of 20 meters per second against a vertical wall so let's have the vertical wall the ball is is the, is coming with 20 meters per second the ball is in contact with the wall for a time of 0 0.1 seconds before rebounding if it rebounds to move in the opposite direction with a speed of 
10 meters per second. So, uh, what is the average force exerted by the wall on the ball? So, we know that force is the rate of change of momentum. So, this is going to be the mass times the change in velocity divided by T. So, this is going to be the mass, which is 0 0.2 kilograms. The velocity changes from 20 to negative 10 because there's a change in direction. It is 20 minus negative 10. The time of contact is 0 0.1. Zero. So I'll press my calculator. 0 0.2 times 30 divided by 0 0.1, which gives us 60. So the answer is going to be B. In the experiment, a metal ball is dropped into a viscous liquid. Uh, the terminal velocity of the ball in the liquid is measured. Terminal velocity is measured. Remember, terminal velocity, the acceleration goes to zero. Terminal velocity, the acceleration is zero because it is a constant velocity. The experiment is repeated four times. So for each repeat, a change is made to one of the following: the density of the ball. So the density uh, of the ball will affect the weight of the ball. Remember, terminal velocity depends on the weight of the ball. And the weight is mg, which is going to be density times volume times g. So changing the density affects the terminal velocity of the ball. So this one is affected. This one affects terminal velocity. The height from which the ball is, is dropped. Uh, the height does not really affect terminal velocity. The density of the liquid. Of course, the density of the liquid will affect the upthrust. And the upthrust will actually affect the terminal velocity. So this one affects the terminal velocity. Then the depth of the liquid. The depth of the liquid is almost uh, the same as the height. I mean the height from which the ball is dropped. The depth of the liquid will also not have an effect just like the depth, uh, the height from which the ball is dropped. So the two things which will affect uh, the, up, the terminal velocity or the terminal speed of the object is going to be the density of the object which will affect its weight and the depth and uh, and the density of the liquid because the density of the liquid will affect the uh, resistive force remember the terminal velocity depends on the weight of the object and the resistive force so the answer is going to be b i'm saying the density of the liquid the density of the liquid will affect the upthrust or the resistive force which affects the speed with which the object moves in the liquid. And then the density of the metal affects the weight of the metal, or the weight of the ball, which also contributes to the speed with which the object moves in the liquid. So there are two points to consider here, density of the metal and the density of the liquid. Two objects move towards each other along the same straight line. Okay? After colliding, the two objects stick together. What does that mean? The relative speed of separation is going to be equal to zero. But initially, if this was moving with a speed u and this was moving with a speed, uh, let's say u1 and this is u2, the relative speed of approach would be u1 minus negative u2, which would be u1 plus u2, which is not equal to zero. Which statement must be correct? The total kinetic energy of the two objects does not change during the collusion we see that uh, relative speed of separation is not the same as relative speed of, of approach. So it means kinetic energy has changed. So this one is not correct. Total momentum of the two objects before the collision is zero. So remember, for uh, if total momentum after collision is going to be... Um, if uh, after colliding, the two objects stick together and are stationary. So it means total momentum after collision, let me call it momentum two, is going to be zero. Momentum one is going to be momentum of this ball plus negative momentum of the other ball because they are in opposite directions. So it means there is a possibility that total momentum before collusion was also zero. So this is going to be correct. The two objects have equal masses. They may not have equal masses. The two objects have the same speeds before the collusion. They may not have the same speeds before collusion. But... Because if they have the same speeds before collision, then why would they stick together after? Why would they st why would they stick together then, and become stationary? So it means 
one object was moving slower than another one and one must have been bigger than the other and that when they collide one cannot cause one just cancels crosses out the speed of the other one in, in, in comparison with the mass so that the total momentum before the collision I mean total momentum after collision becomes zero so the answer is going to be B if the objects are stationary remember momentum is always conserved Total momentum before collision should always be equal to total momentum after collision, whether the collision is elastic or inelastic. That's why the answer is going to be B. A minimum torque of 20 newton meters must be applied to the lead of a jar for it to open. The radius of the lead is 4 centimeters. So that means the perpendicular distance between the two is going to be 8 centimeters. So what is the minimum force F that must act on each side of the lead? So remember torque is the product of force, one of the forces times the perpendicular distance between them. So the torque is given as 20 newtons, newton meters, then this should be called product of one of the forces and the perpendicular distance is 8 times 10 to the power of minus 2 to change it to meters. So I'll simply say 20 divided by 8 exponent minus 2 so this is giving me 250, so F should be equal to 250 newtons, so the answer is going to be C. A uniform bar of length L and weight W rests horizontal on two separate two supports X and Y. Its length is L, that means and it is uniform, that means its weight is at the midpoint. So this length here is going to be a half of L. So this is L divided by 2. And if that is L divided by 2, the whole of this length is also L divided by 2, but I have to subtract L over 6 to get this length alone. 1 over 6 minus, I mean 1 over 2 minus 1 over 6. I think 1 over 2 minus 1 over 6 is going to give me, uh, this is 1 over 3. LOCM is 3. That is 2, 1. So that is 1 over 3. So this length is going to be L divided by 3. Okay, so they told us that the bar is in equilibrium. That means the sum of clockwise moments should be called the sum of anticlockwise moments. So I will say W times the perpendicular distance, which is L over 3. Uh, this is clockwise. I'm taking moments about support X. Moments about support X. About support X. So W times the perpendicular distance L over 3 should be equal to the anticlockwise is going to be R y times the perpendicular distance, which is this distance here. And this distance is L over 3 plus L over 2, which is, I think that is 5, a third plus a half. LOCM is 6, so this is 5 over 6. So this distance is 5 over 6 of L. So this is times 5 over 6 L. So L has cancelled out. I'll change the color. L cancels out. And I want the ratio. Remember, I want the ratio. Uh, what is the ratio Rx over Ry? So let me just find Ry first. So Ry is going to be equal to W over 3 times 6 times 6 over 5, which is uh, I think that is twice W divided by 5. That is Ry. Then Rx, of course, Ry plus Rx should give me W. That is the second, first condition. The resultant force should be 0. So if I add, that means Rx is going to be W minus 2W over 5. And the LOCM is 5, so this gives me 3W divided by 5. So that is Rx. So let's check the ratio. So the ratio is the ratio is going to be equal to Rx, which is 3W over 5, divided by Ry, which is 2W over 5. When you get the reciprocal, W cancels, 5 cancels. So you get... Um, 3 divided by 2 as the ratio. So the answer is going to be A. 
A type of firework is made by connecting two rockets facing in opposite directions, as shown in the diagram, to a rod as shown. The rod is attached to a frictionless pivot so that the firework can rotate in a vertical plane. The firework has weight W. Okay, the pivot exerts a force R on the rod that is equal to the and opposed to W. Okay. Each rocket exerts a force of magnitude F on the rod at a perpendicular distance D from the pivot. The forces exerted by the rockets are always in opposite directions. So they constitute what we call a couple. Air resistance is negligible. Which statement is correct? So, of course, uh, the forces are going to cause this to rotate uh, in a clockwise direction. W and R will cause no, uh, because they are acting through the pivot, they have no moment. So there is no equilibrium, the rotation is clockwise. The resultant force is zero because the forces are equal but opposite. So resultant force is zero, but the resultant torque is not equal to zero. There is a rotation which is clockwise. The resultant torque is clockwise. So the firework is in equilibrium. That is not possible. The firework is in equilibrium. That's not possible because the torque is not zero. The resultant torque is not zero. The firework is not in equilibrium. That is true. The firework is not in equilibrium. So the two statements are true. We have to choose which one gives a more appropriate answer. C says because the resultant force acting on it is not zero. It is zero because the forces are equal but opposite. So this is not true. Because the resultant torque acting on it is not zero. That is very true. The resultant torque acting on it is not zero. It causes a clockwise rotation. So the answer is going to be D. An object of weight W is suspended from a newton meter when the object is completely immersed in water, the newton meter reads P. Okay, so when it is completely immersed in water, the newton meter reads P. Let's find the apparent loss in weight. The apparent loss in weight is going to be, of course, the weight in air, which is W, minus the weight in water, which is going to be P. That is the apparent loss in weight. Remember, the apparent loss in weight is equal to the upthrust. So the upthrust, which is equal to mass times G, which is the density times volume times G, is equal to W minus P. The apparent, the difference in weight is the upthrust. So it means the density of water this side is going to be the apparent loss in weight divided by V times G. And we notice that the volume is the same for these two. After all, the, the B cars are identical. The volume is the same. G is the same. On the left-hand side, when the object is completely immersed in oil, the Newton meter reads W. So the apparent loss in weight is going to be W minus Q. So the upthrust to this side, which is equal to density of the oil, times volume times G is going to be the weight in air minus Q. So that means the density of the oil is going to be W minus Q divided by V times G. So what is the ratio of density, density of oil over density of water? So density of oil is W minus Q over V times G divided by. So when I divide this by, W minus P over V times G, I get the reciprocal, so it is W minus Q over W minus P, which means the answer is going to be D. A crate of mass 50 kilograms pushed a distance 6, six meters along a horizontal surface against a constant resistive force of 70 newtons. The crate moves at a constant speed. It is then lifted at a constant speed through a vertical distance of 1.2 meters onto the back of a lorry. What is the total work done in this process? So there are two things here. It is gaining gravitational potential energy, but there is also work done against friction. So it means the total work done is going to be equal to uh, the work done, work done against friction, work done against friction plus the gain because it is lifted 
to vertical distance so that it is gain in gravitational potential energy. So the work done against friction is equal to the force, frictional force times the distance plus the gain in potential energy which is mgh. So the total work done is going to be the frictional force which is 70 times the distance through which it moves which is 6 plus the mass which is 50 times g which is 9.81 times the vertical height through which it moves which is 1.2. So I'll just check with my calculator 70 times 6 plus 50 times 9.81 times 1.2, which gives me um, 1008, 1008.6 joules. So it means the answer is going to be D. The input power to a television is P in. The useful sound and light power emitted by the television is P out. What is the efficiency of the television? Of course, we know that efficiency is equal to the useful power output over the total power input. So the answer is automatically going to be A. The useful power output over the total power input, that is efficiency. A builder holding a brick of mass 3,000 grams, which is 3 kilograms, drops the brick on his foot. What is a reasonable estimate of the change in gravitational potential energy of the brick. Of course, I have to estimate the vertical height of a builder. So the vertical height of a builder, I'm just, you can estimate using your own height. But I know that the vertical height of a person, maybe the, the maximum should be around two meters. In, uh, I think that is, I don't know the tallest, but around two meters, that is the biggest I I can think about, oh, not more than three meters. It can't go beyond three meters. So, there are two ways of doing this. I can check backwards by using the energies. We know that gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh. So, I'm going to check the values of h. So, h should be the potential energy divided by m times g. So let's check the first one. I will start with um, 30,000. Let me start with uh, 300,000, 300 joules. So this is going to be 300 joules divided by the mass, which is 3 kilograms, times g, which is 9.81. So what is h? 300 divided by 3 times 9.81. So this is giving me approximately 10 meters. There is no body who is 10 meters tall. So if B is wrong, automatically C is going to be wrong. D is also going to be wrong because if 300 Jews give a person of 10 meters, then how about uh, it means 3,000 may give a person of 100 meters and 30,000 may give a person of 1,000 meters high or tall. So it means H is most likely going to be 30 divided by uh, 3 times 9.81. So we can check if this is a reasonable 30 divided by open bracket 3 times 9.81. So this is approximately 1 meter, 1.0 meters. So this is this is at least reasonable. There are people shorter than as short as 1 meter. So the answer is going to be A. An elastic cord of unstretched total length 16 centimeters and cross-sectional area 2 times 10 to the power of minus 6 is held horizontally by two smooth pins, a distance of 8 centimeters apart. Of course, this is a past paper question. If you have been following my videos, you must have seen this question uh, being solved in one of the videos. The cord obeys Hooke's law, so it means we can use f is equal to kx. Or we can use equations for young modulus, stress and strain. A load of mass 0.4 kg is suspended centrally on the cord. The angle between the two sides of the cord supporting the load is 60 degrees. The unstretched length, remember, is 8 centimeters. Here we see the total stretched length is, so we are saying that L0 is 8 centimeters. Then the stretched length is um, 
course this is 8 centimeters plus 8 plus 8 so it is 3 times 8 which is equal to 24 centimeters which means um, So it means uh, if that is 8 centimeters, oh sorry, the unstretched length is 8 plus 8 is 8 to the other side, so that is 16. So then we have 8 plus 8 plus 8, so it means the extension E is going to be 24 minus 16, which is 8 centimeters, that is the extension. So all we need is going to be the force, because remember, the question wants us to find young modulus, and we know that young modulus is stress over strain, which is force over area, divided by extension of original length, which becomes original length, divided by the extension E. So I know the original length, I know the extension, um, I know the cross-sectional area, all that I don't have is the force, and the force is going to be the tension in the code. So I have to find the tension T in the code. The tension here is going to be the same as the tension here, so I have to resolve this vertically upwards. To be able to find that tension. So if I resolve the tension vertically upwards, this is going to be T. When I divide this into 2, because it's symmetrical, this is going to be 30 degrees. This is also going to be 30 degrees. So resolving T in the vertical, it will be T cos of 30. So for equilibrium, total forces upwards will be T cos 30 plus T cos 30, because there are two. So I'll have that twice T cos 30 is going to be called the weight downwards, which is mg. So it means the tension T in the code is going to be mg, which is 0 0.4 times 9.81 divided by 2 cos, divided by 2 cos of 30. So what is the tension here? Remember the tension is the force I'm looking for in the code. Of course the tension everywhere is going to be the same. So I have 0 0.4 times 9.81 divided by uh, 2 cos of 30. So I'm getting 2.266. 2.266. Newtons. That is the force. So now I'm just substituting here to find the young modulus. The force is 2.266 newtons times the original length, which is 8, times 10 to the power of minus 2 to change it to meters, divided by the cross-sectional area, which is given as 2.0 times 10 to the power of minus 6, times the extension, which is 8, times Sorry, the original length is 16, not 8. I don't know why I'm making this error every time. The original length of the code is 16, but the extension is 24 minus 16, which is 8 times 10 to the power of minus 2. So I'll just press my calculator. So 2.266 times 16 exponent minus 2. Divide by 2 exponent minus 6. Divide by 8 exponent minus 2. So I'm getting 2.226600. Uh, those are 1, 2, 3. Those are 6 zero. So it is 2.266 times 10 to the power of 6 which is approximately 2.3. So the answer is going to be C. Which force extension graph shows plastic deformation of a sample of material? Of course, for plastic deformation, there should be an extension retained when the deforming force is removed. So this one shows elastic. This one is showing elastic because there is no extension when the force is removed. You see the arrow is pointing back to zero. This one is also showing elastic because there is no extension which, is, which remains. You see the loading goes back to zero, unloading goes back to zero. So the answer is D because on loading we follow this path here. On unloading there is an extension which remains. So this extension means the material was deformed plastically.
So the answer is going to be D. Two waves are passed through a point P. The graph shows the duration with the time T of the displacement S of the two waves at point P. What is the phase difference? What is the phase difference between the two waves at point P? Of course, if they have a phase difference, it's because they have the same frequency. So phase is going to be, um, the answers are in degrees, so I'll say 360 into T divided by the period. Time out of step between the two waves divided by the period. So that is 360. The time out of step, I consider just two corresponding points. So this is 7 and the other one is 8. So this gives us 1. So that is one. Then the period is going to be eight seconds, which is one over eight. So I'll just say I'll just say three sixty divided by eight, which is forty five. So the phase difference is going to be forty five degrees, which makes the answer to be B. Which row is correct for both progressive transverse waves and longitudinal progressive longitudinal waves? Correct for both. So we know that uh, for progress for trans for longitudinal waves they have rare factions and compressions, which makes A to be wrong. Because transverse waves do not have rare factions and compressions. Then compressions and rare factions are for transverse longitudinal waves. Then we know that longitudinal waves. It is only transverse waves that can be polarized, so this makes C to be wrong. So A is wrong and C is wrong because longitudinal waves cannot be polarized. Then we know that for transverse waves, particles vibrate perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave. By the way, this is what has made this C wrong, and this is what made A wrong. Do not misquote me. We know that for transverse particles, vibrate perpendicular to the direction of propagation of energy. Yet for longitudinal particles vibrate parallel. So this one is making this statement to be wrong because particles in longitudinal vibrate parallel. So it means D is also wrong. So the correct answer is going to be B. Transverse waves undergo polarization. Longitudinal waves have compressions and rear factions. So our, our correct answer is going to be uh, B. A toy drone emits a sound of constant frequency, 800 hertz. The speed of sound in the air is 330 meters per second. The drone moves along a straight path directed towards, it is towards the observer. So if it is towards the observer, we know that the observed frequency is going to be V divided by V minus the speed of the source, then times F frequency of the source. Okay. So what is the velocity of the drone when the frequency of the sound heard by the observer is 850? So observed frequency is 850, but the normal frequency is 800, and 800 hertz. So we have that 850 is equal to the speed of sound, which is 330, divided by 330 minus the speed of the source times 800. So it means 330 minus the speed of the source is going to be 330 times 800 divided by 850. So it means the speed Vs is going to be 330 minus 330 times 800 divided by 850. So I will start with the bracket 330 times 800 divided by 850. Then I'll say 330 minus the answer, which gives me 19.4. So this is 19.4. So the speed is 19. So we ignore B and D. Then remember the uh, it is moving directly, so it is, this velocity should be towards the observer. The velocity is in the same direction as the displacement. So the answer is going to be the answer is going to be C. 19 meters per second towards the observer, not away from the observer. Which statement about electromagnetic waves in a vacuum is correct? Remember, they all travel the speed of light. So I see they are comparing wavelengths and frequencies. So I will just write a read smother 
is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. Reed's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. So this is uh, increasing frequency, and this side it is increasing wavelength. So wavelength, this is greatest on the radio waves. That means gamma rays have the shortest wavelength, but gamma rays have the highest frequency, radio waves have the smallest frequency. So infrared waves have shorter wavelengths than visible light. Infrared. So remember the wavelength is greater on the left. So infrared have a greater wavelength than visible. So this is not correct. Microwaves have longer wavelength than radio. We see that uh, radio waves have the longest wavelength. So this is not correct. Ultraviolet waves have higher frequency than visible light. Ultra is on, the, on this side and visible is here. Remember frequency increases to the right hand side. So this statement is correct. Ultra has a higher frequency than visible light. So the answer is most likely going to be C. These automatically wrong. Gamma rays have lower frequency than X. We see that gamma rays have the highest frequency. So the answer is C. Vertically polarized waves are emitted from a source. The microwaves are detected by a receiver that is connected to a cathode ray oscilloscope. The waveform displayed on the screen on the CRO has an amplitude of 2.6 centimeters. So original amplitude is 2.6 centimeters. A metal wire grid that acts as a polarizing filter is now placed between the source and the receiver. The filter is oriented so that the plane of polarization of the transmitted wave is at an angle of 20 degrees. Okay, so it's like this. Uh, it's like what is going to be transmitted must be, I must take uh, the, the A naught in the direction of the 20 degrees. So it means since amplitude is a vector quantity because it's maximum displacement, so it means I'm going to resolve A naught in the direction of the axis of transmission. So the new amplitude which is going to be transmitted must be 2.6. When I resolve, uh, if this is A naught and I want to resolve to the direction of the, of the axis of transmission, then it will be 2.6 cos of 20. 2.6 cos of 20, let's check. 2.6 cos 20, that is 2.44. So let's see the question. The distance between the source and the receiver is unchanged. The settings on the CRO are also unchanged. What is now the amplitude of the waveform displayed on the screen of the CRO? So our answer is going to be D, 2.4 centimeters. So this is 2.4 centimeters. In an experiment, a stationary wave is formed on a string stretched horizontally between two fixed points. Which statement about the experiment is correct? The first one, remember a stationary wave between two fixed strings. Let me just give you an example here of uh, just two loops. If this is fixed and this is fixed. So if this is a node, this is a node, this is a node, this is an antinode, this is an antinode. It means there is always one more node than the antinodes. At certain times, the string between two nodes is horizontal with all points having zero displacement. Such a time does not exist on a stationary wave. Let me see. At certain times, the string between two nodes. Oh, sorry about this. At certain times, just at certain times, the string between two nodes, the string between two nodes is horizontal with all points having zero displacement. At certain times, the string between two nodes is horizontal with all points having zero displacement. Each point on the string between two antinodes has an oscillation of the same amplitude. Of course, this one is not correct because each point has different amplitude. The number of nodes is equal to the number of antinodes. This is not true. We always have one more node than antinodes. Two adjacent antinodes oscillate in phase. That is not true. If this is vibe oscillating in that direction, the node antinode here is oscillating in the opposite direction. That means the answer is going to be A. Because we know that the phase difference between two antinodes is always 180 degrees. In other words, two particles, particles in two adjacent segments are always 180 degrees out of phase. So at certain times, the string between two nodes 
is horizontal with all points having zero displacement because at nodes the particles have zero displacement so it means the answer is going to be a a musical organ produces notes by blowing air into a set of pipes that are open at one end and closed at the other the speed of sound in the air in the pipes is 320 meters per second what is the lowest frequency of sound produced by a pipe so since it is closed at one end, I will sketch this. This is a closed pipe at one end. The length of the pipe, which I'm going to call L, I think this is just a quarter of a cycle. So L is equal to 1 over 4 of wavelength. So it means the wavelength is going to be 4 times L. The length of the pipe, remember, is 10 meters. So frequency is equal to V over wavelength. And V is 320. And the wavelength is 4L, which is 4 times 10. So I'll just say 320 divided by 40, which is 8. So the answer is going to be B. So this is 8. The answer is B. In an experiment, water waves in a ripple tank are instant on a gap, as shown. Remember, diffraction is maximum when the wavelength is very close or approximately the same in magnitude as the size of the gap. The wavelength should almost be the same as the size of the gap for diffraction to be maximum. Which changes to the experiment would provide a better demonstration of diffraction? Remember, the wavelength should be almost the same as the size of the gap. Increase the amplitude. The amplitude does not affect the wavelength or the size of the gap. Increase the frequency. The frequency of a wave depends on the source. So this one will not affect diffraction. There's no way it affects diffraction. Increase the wavelength of the waves. If we increase the wavelength, because look at the gap. The gap is very large. This is a large gap. So it means we need to widen the distance between these two. We need to make a wavelength bigger to match the size of the gap. So the answer here is going to be C. Because the wavelength is very small, if we increase it to match the size of the gap, if the wavelength is very close to the size of the gap, it means there will be maximum diffraction. This one is wrong, increasing the width of the gap, because increasing the width of the gap means making it even bigger than the wavelength. And if the width is even much bigger than the wavelength, diffraction is smaller. So the answer is going to be C. Light of wavelength of lambda is emitted from two point sources R and S and falls onto a distant screen. At point P on the screen, the light intensity is zero. So it's like, let's say P is at Let's say it is at the center between R and S. What could explain the zero intensity at P? So zero intensity at P is most likely going to be due to destructive interference. It is a minimum. So destructive interference is either the path difference. Path difference is equal to a half wavelength. Or it is... Um, 2n plus 1, 2n plus 1 of lambda over 2, where when n is 0, so this is the path difference for destructive interference. But this is only going to be true if the phase difference between r and s is initially 0. If the phase difference between r and s is initially 0, then at p, the path difference between the waves from r and s should be either half lambda uh, 3 over 2 lambda and so on and so forth. But if the phase difference between R and S is 180 degrees, for 180 degrees, then the path difference between R and S when they arrive at P will not be a half lambda. It will be the other way around. So let's check this. Let's do inspection. Light from the two sources is emitted 180 degrees out of phase. And the path difference is 180 degrees. Of course, if it is 180 degrees out of phase from the source, and the path difference is one is a half wavelength, which is also 180 degrees out of phase. It means 180 and 180 gives us 360, which is now going to become phase. They appear in phase at P. If it is out of phase, the sources are out of phase, 180 degrees, and the path difference is a half wavelength. Half wavelength is also half a cycle. It means Half a cycle for the source and half a cycle for the distance will give us now a full cycle. And a full cycle implies a constructive interference. So this one is not going to be correct. 
Light from the two sources is emitted in phase. If it is in phase, the path difference should be half lambda. If it is lambda, then that is constructive interference. So this one is also not correct. If the path difference is lambda, we don't expect zero intensity at P. It will be maximum intensity because that will be appearing in phase. Light from the two sources is emitted at is emitted 90 degrees out of phase. Okay. And the path difference is wavelength. So if it is 90 degrees out of phase and the path difference is wavelength, then still we cannot have, um, we, we are just going to have an intermediate between a maximum and minimum. So it means the answer is going to be D. Light from the two sources emitted in a phase, the path difference must be a half lambda. If it is in a phase and the path difference is a half lambda, at P it is a, a, a minimum. If it is in phase and the path difference is n times wavelength, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth, then we know that there will be a, min, a maximum at P. That will be constructive interference. But if the, the phase difference for the source is 0, they're in phase, and the path difference is 2n plus 1 into lambda over 2. That is destructive interference. So the answer is D. A beam of red light of wavelength 720 nanometers is the normal on a diffraction grating and produces a diffraction pattern on a screen placed prior to the grating. The beam of red light is replaced with a beam of electromagnetic radiation of wavelength X, which is incident normal on the same diffraction grating. The third order maximum for a uh, for electromagnetic radiation of wavelength X is at the same position on the screen as the second order. That means theta is the same. Theta is going to be the same. Remember for diffraction grating, N lambda is equal to D sine theta. So I'm going to come up with two equations. For the first one, when N is three, the wavelength is lambda for X is going to be the separation of the slits sine of theta. Then, when the n is equal to 2, the wavelength is for red, um, for red, and this is going to be d sine theta. So when I divide the two equations, I have 3 times lambda x over 2 times the wavelength of red is 720, should be equal to 1. So what is lambda x? So lambda x is 2 times 7, 720 divided by 3. 2 times 720 divided by 3, which is 480. So the answer is going to be A. This is equal to 480 nanometers. The current I in equation is given by the equation I is equal to A N V Q. What does the letter N represent? Of course, this is number of free electrons per unit. I mean number of free electrons per unit volume or the charge density of free electrons number of free electrons per unit volume number of free electrons per unit volume so we have charge carried per charge carrier that is supposed to be q so a is wrong number of charge carriers per unit area it should be per unit volume number of charge carriers per unit volume so the answer is going to be c in the circuit shown, but the battery has an EMF of 6 volts and negligible internal resistance. The three resistors each have resistance R. The total power dissipated in the resistor network is 24 watts. What is the value of R? Okay. So these two resistors are in series, so they give us total of 2R. Now we have a combination that is in parallel, so we have Total resistance in the parallel is going to be R times 2R divided by R plus 2R, which gives us, uh, this is going to be 2R squared divided by 3R, which gives us 2R divided by 3. That is total resistance. And we know that power is equal to PD squared divided by R. So the power is going to be equal to the P, this is over total resistance because it is total power. So it's going to be V squared divided by total resistance, which is 2R over 3. So this means it will be 3 times um, V, which is, I'm just getting the reciprocal, so times 6 squared divided by 2R. So remember the power is 24, so I'll say 
24 is equal to 3 times 6 squared divided by 2r. So r is going to be 3 times 6 squared divided by 2 times 24. So I'll press my calculator. 3 times 6 squared divided by 2 times 24. So that is 2.25. R is 2.25 ohms, which makes the answer to be D. Which graph could show how the resistance R of a filament lamp varies with the applied PD as V is increased to the normal operating PD? Okay, to answer this, I'll sketch a graph for uh, I against V. Remember the graph of current against V for a filament lamp? It becomes, it has a decreasing gradient. And remember the gradient, so um, the resistance here is going to be equal to 1 over the gradient. Because if I, if I have, if I try to find the gradient here, the resistance is 1 over the gradient because I have change in I on the Y axis over change in V on the, on the X axis, which is the reciprocal of the, of the reciprocal of V equals to I times R, or R is V over I. So the gradient is, the resistance is 1 over the gradient. That's number 1. So if the resistance is 1 of the gradient, uh, and we notice that the gradient is tending to 0, the gradient is tending to zero from the I, I against V for a filament lamp. The gradient tends to zero, which means the resistance tends to infinity. It is not becoming constant, it is tending to infinity. So it means C is wrong because it shows a decrease in a, a constant resistance. This wrong shows a decrease in a resistance. B is also wrong because the line is becoming horizontal, meaning that the resistance is increasing and then becoming constant. Yet we are seeing it tends to infinity, so the answer is going to be A. The answer is automatically going to be A because the resistance should be tending to infinity. A piece of conducting put is in, this, in the shape of a cylinder, length 60 millimeters, diameter 20 millimeters. The resistance between the ends of the cylinder is 20 ohms. What is the resistivity of the putty? So we know that our resistance is equal to rho L over cross-sectional area. That is the resistance. And our area is pi d squared. So area is going to be to equal to pi d squared over, over 4. That is the area. So I'm going to combine the two. It means resistance is going to be 4 rho L over pi d squared. So I, am, I want to find the resistivity, so I'm making rho the subject. So it means your rho is going to be equal to r times pi d squared divided by uh, 4l. So I'll just substitute in here. r is 20 times pi times d, which is 20 times 10 to the power of minus 3 by this is squared divided by the length is 4 times 60 times 10 to the power of minus 3. So I'll check with my calculator. 20 pi open brackets 20 exponent minus 3 and this is squared divide by uh, 4 times 60 exponent minus 3 and that gives you 0 0.1047 which is approximately 0 0.10 so the answer is going to be B. Which statement about the EMF of a cell is always correct? Remember EMF is the energy converted from chemical to electrical per unit charge. So EMF is the energy converted from electrical. That is not true. It is always from chemical. EMF is the energy provided by the cell per unit charge. That could be making sense. EMF is PD across the internal resistance. That is called lost volts, not EMF. The EMF is PD across the terminals of the cell. The PD across the terminals of the cell is the same, still the same as um, 
if it is delivering a current, it is still the same as uh, the, uh, the lost volts. Oh, sorry, the PD across the terminals of the cell, if it is delivering a current, is the terminal PID, not the EMF. So the answer is going to be B, the total energy provided by the cell prime charge passing through it. Kachofo's first law and second laws are a consequence of conservation of which quantities? Of course, first law is charge. That is uh, the sum of currents into the junction is equal to the sum of currents out of the junction. And remember, current is the rate of flow of charge. The second law is energy because it involves EMFs and PDs. And remember, PD is the energy per unit charge. That is electrical to thermal. And EMF is the energy per unit charge, which is chemical to electrical. So first law is charge, second law is energy. So meaning the answer is automatically going to be A. A circuit uh, contains a cell of EMF E and internal resistance R connected to a resistor of resistance R. The current in the circuit is I. What equation is correct? So I'll just draw in a loop to use Kachofu's second law. The sum of EMFs is going to be E because I'm moving. When I move around, I move, meet negative for positive terminals, so the EMF is positive. The sum of PDs, there's a PD here, the current is still the same I, the current is the same through both resistors. So we have I times R plus, because the current is the same direction as the loop, so this will be plus I times capital R. So E is going to be equal to IR plus IR. So D is wrong, and B is automatically wrong because there's a minus. Then uh, C and D are, sorry, C, C is wrong because it's showing it is IR minus. This one is the same as E equals to IR minus I small r. So this is wrong. So the answer is A. When I take this the other side, it will be E minus IR equals to I capital R. A, P, a potential divider of two resistors of resistance C, R1, and R2 connected in series across the source of potential difference V in and PD across R1 is out. Is V out. The PD across R1 is V out. Which changes to R1 and R2 will increase the value of V out? So using the potential divider formula, I know that V out is the, uh, V in is divided in the ratio of the resistances. So this will be R1 divided by R1 plus R2. Then we multiply this by the input V in. So we want V out to increase. If V out is to increase, the numerator must be automatically bigger. So R1 should increase. R1 should increase. And if the numerator is bigger, that means R1 should increase. And if R1 is if R1 has increased, we should make the denominator to be smaller by reducing R2. So it means R2. R2 should be decreased. So which changes, which changes will increase the value of V out? We make the numerator as big as possible. We make the denominator as small as possible. So we have already made R1 to be big. So the only option we are left with is to make R2 to be very small. So which changes to R1 and R2 will increase? So we have to increase R1, which means we ignore C and D because we are ha it involves halving. Then we must make R2 very small, which means A is out because it's doubling R2. So the answer is going to be B. Two alpha particles with the same kinetic energy are moving towards and are then deflected by a gold nucleus. Which diagram could show the paths of the two alpha particles? Of course, uh, when an alpha particle comes close to the nucleus, it is deflected away from the nucleus. So A is wrong because this path is wrong. An alpha particle cannot be deflected close to the nucleus or towards the nucleus. Then um, B is also wrong because an alpha particle which is closest to the nucleus experiences more repulsion than the one which is far away. So this path is wrong. Because this deflect, this, uh, the path of the alpha particle which is closest to the nucleus cannot have a smaller deviation than the one which is further. Then automatically C is wrong because I said the deflection cannot be close to the nucleus. So it means the answer is going to be D. The path which is closest to the nucleus undergoes much deflection. The 
the angle of deflection is bigger than the path which is far from the nucleus. So the, compare the angle of deflection there and the angle of deflection here. So it means the answer is D. So this one is theta 2 and theta 1. Theta 2 should be greater than theta 1. So the answer is D. Which nuclide is formed f uh, when carbon 10, 6 undergoes beta plus decay? So we have carbon 10, 6 is decay into a nucleus to give us beta plus. Beta plus is 0, 1. Let the nucleus formed be X. Nucleon number remains 10. Proton number must reduce to 5 so that proton number is conserved. So the answer is automatically C. A part, I mean, a particular hadron is composed of three quarks and has zero charge. Three quarks, zero charge. What is the possible combination of combination composition of the hadron? Remember, down, strange, and down, strange, and bottom. These ones have a charge of minus one over three e. And then uh, top, charm, and up. These ones have a charge of plus 2 over 3e. So we can check total charge. Down, down, strange. These ones have the same charge, so it is negative 1 over 3 times 3, which is going to give us negative 1e. So it means a is out. Up, down, strange. So that is 2 over 3e uh, plus minus 1 over 3e plus minus 1 over 3e. This one gives us a charge of 0. A particular hadron is composed of three quarks and has zero charge, so it means the answer is going to be B. This one, up, up, down, is 2 over 3e plus 2 over 3e minus 1 over 3e, which gives us plus 1e, so it means this is out. Up, up, strange, it is the same as that, 2 over 3e plus 2 over 3e, strange is minus 1 over 3e, this gives us plus e. So it means our answer is D, is B. Okay, so I think that marks the end of, this marks the end of 1-1. Um, one, one. See you in 1-2. I, th I think I've tried to keep time. Until next time, bye-bye. I love you.